anniversary of the Battle of Shiloh, the first day of the Battle of Shiloh. And on the anniversaries of the battle, the National Park Service puts on an unusual type of battlefield program. Uh, they can be much longer than they normally are. Normally in the summer when you come here for a program, it'll be about a 30 minute, maybe a 45 minute program. These programs are scheduled to go to two or two and a half hours. It's also a program where we're going to cover a lot of terrain. Uh, so again, if you come back in the summer for a ranger-led tour, usually if they'll do a tour about the UDC monument or something like that, and you might have to walk from your car to here and back or something like that. We, however, are going to cover a lot of terrain. Uh, probably two and a half or three miles uh, in our two and a half hours. And uh, we are also not going to necessarily restrict ourselves to the trails. So we're going to be going through the woods, we're going to be jumping into the creeks, uh, we're going to be going through the briars, um, and... Um, well, now, Jeff didn't even do that yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> we don't actually, we don't have that much off-trail business uh, this time, but we do have about a quarter of a mile of our trail is we're going to go off of our tour, we're going to go off the trail and uh, go through the woods. Uh, the good news is the woods seem to be, um, the woods seem to be quite clear still. I guess maybe you had a fairly dry winter down here and uh, a lot of the a lot of the thorns and the vines and things like that don't seem to be out yet. I haven't had any trouble with them yet. Um, but we will do about a quarter of a mile through the through the woods. The ticks are out. <laughs> the ticks are out. Yes, I found some last night. Yeah, I did too. Yeah. <laughs> so I can't tell you how to dodge them out here, but look for them later. You know how to do that. <laughs> Looks like we got everything. Awesome. Well then, good afternoon and welcome to Shiloh National Military Park. My name is Bjorn Skaptison and I am a uh, volunteer here at the park. I had the privilege a few years ago uh, to serve the park as a seasonal ranger during the summers. Did that while I was in school. And um, so, now they let me come back. Only once a year though. They let me come back and participate in these <laughs> anniversary programs. Uh, and so that's what we're gonna do today. The program we're gonna do today, if you, if you come to any of these programs, if you come to any given day at Shiloh, um, if you ever come out here at all, you're going to find a hornet's nest program. Somebody someday at some point during the day is going to talk about the hornet's nest and that is uh, the defense of the Union Army Center during the larger portion of the first day of the battle. We're going to talk about why it's called the hornet's nest later but I think a lot of you might already know. Um, as a natural contrarian therefore I have decided this year to come up with a hornet's nest program that doesn't really include that much of the hornet's nest. Now we're going to go there. We're going to talk about it and we're going to see those parts of the hornet's nest. Uh, especially those that are relevant to our topic today. Our topic today is the participation of Union General William H. L. Wallace in this battle. And the participation of his second division of Grant's Army of the Tennessee in the battle. Now, you can't call Wallace an unheralded general, although I did in the title of this uh, program. It's probably not a very good word. I just told it and they printed it so we had to go with it. I think Wallace is pretty well known. I think those of us who know a little bit about the Battle of Shiloh know that Wallace defended the center of the Union line. I think we might be more familiar with a fellow named General Benjamin Prentiss, uh, who defended a small portion of the line further down, part of the places, one of those places we're not going to go this afternoon. 
And so this, why this program is gonna be a little different is that we are really gonna focus on Wallace and Wallace's division. And I, I do believe that Wallace and his division had a larger hand in defending the center of the Union battle line than did General Prentiss and the 800 or so survivors uh, of his 6th Division who were still with him. Um, mm -hmm. I also believe that certainly half of the failure of the Hornet's Nest position is due to a failure within Wallace's division. And so we're going to look at that. We're going to look at uh, how, that, how that affected the failure of this position, which ultimately resulted in the surrender of 2,250 Union soldiers on the site where we're standing now. Uh, after the hornet's nest was reduced, where we're standing now is where the Union soldiers were captured. But first, let's talk a little bit about William H.L. Wallace. William Hervey Lamb Wallace, born in Ohio, Dublin, Ohio, moved to Illinois when he was a very young man. And so he grew up in Illinois. He grew up in LaSalle County, Illinois, and was eventually identified uh, when he moved there and settled there with the town of Ottawa, Illinois. You can still go there today and see his, uh, uh, see his portrait on the wall. That's where he's buried. As a young man, he studied law and studied it well enough that uh, in those days, if you studied law the same way a law student would today, you'd want to find a, uh, uh, a law firm to study at. Now it would be an internship. Back in those days, the internship was your entire law program. This was uh, before the time of the, uh, the invention of the JD and the, J and the law school. So. Wallace, very promising young attorney in the middle part of Illinois, had a chance to study and intern at the law firm of Lincoln and Herndon in Springfield, Illinois. They offered him the job, turned him down. Turned down Abe Lincoln for a job in his law office. Uh, turned him down because he had a chance to study with um, a, uh, a judge up in Ottawa named T. Lyle Dickey, Judge Dickey. And he moved to Ottawa, he lived with Judge Dickey, and he clerked and studied law there until he could uh, pass the bar in Illinois, uh, which at that time was a, simply an, an oral quiz. Uh, you didn't have to sit down for the bar like, like people do today. So, he becomes an attorney. He lives with the Dickies. Um, he becomes acquainted with their young daughter, Anne, Anne Dickey. And uh, she's, a, she's young, just a child when he moves there. And then, uh, and he studies, and he earns his law license, and he goes out and he practices on his own. When she's 17 years old, uh, William comes back to the household, and he uh, asks if she would marry him. She was very surprised. She always thought of him as, you know, one of her dad's friends, and um, he's a little bit older than her. Uh, but it was a pleasant surprise, and she accepted, and uh, William and Ann Wallace married. This was before the excitement of 1846. The excitement of 1846 is when, for reasons best explained by President Polk of Tennessee, we decided to go take half of Mexico. And so the U.S.-Mexico War started, 1846. Genuine gripes on both sides, of course. And volunteers needed to be called up. Volunteers for a new volunteer army. For an expedition like this, going all the way to Mexico to fight Santa Ana. Uh, they couldn't just do that with the regular army. They had to call up volunteers. And so Wallace joined the first regiment of Illinois Volunteers, and being a well-educated guy, being a, a young attorney, um, he was made adjutant of that <laughs> regiment. Adjutant comes with the rank of first lieutenant. It is the chief clerk for a regiment of 1,000 men. 
Uh, it was up to him to make sure everybody got paid, that everybody got their supplies, that everybody got their food. He would make sure that everybody was there on duty. Lieutenant Wallace, adjutant of the 1st Illinois Regiment. One of his comrades in the 1st Illinois Regiment, captain of Company G, was Captain Benjamin Mabry Prentice. And so Prentice and Wallace went to war together in 1846 down in Mexico. Uh, they participated in the Northern Mexico Campaign. Uh, they were not there for the first battles, but in 1847 they arrived to reinforce General Zachary Taylor and participated in the famous Battle of Buena Vista. Uh, now the Battle of Buena Vista is going to be fairly important to our story because that's part of Wallace's story. First Regiment was commanded by a guy named John Harden, a famous Illinois attorney and a friend of Abraham Lincoln, a distant um, relative of Mary Lincoln. During the Battle of Buena Vista, Colonel Hardin takes the 1st Illinois Regiment and they make a charge against Santa Ana's lines. Santa Ana's lines are pushed back in the push back across the desert. And Colonel Hardin and the 1st Illinois pursue until they realize much to their unpleasant surprise that they are simply pushing back the forward elements of Santa Ana's army and now they are up against the rest of Santa Ana's army, 20,000 Mexican soldiers coming back the other way. Now the 1st Illinois has to beat feet, get back in the other direction. <coughs> the battlefield of Buena Vista is desert cut with very deep ravines. Think about our ravines and make them deeper. And Colonel Hardin took a good part of the 1st Illinois Regiment down into those ravines to try to escape. Went down a ravine, went to the mouth of the ravine, and when he got there and it spread out onto the prairie, there were all of the Mexican Lancers on their horses. The Mexican Lancers charged and they wiped out Colonel Hardin and his group of Illinois soldiers. The 1st Illinois Regiment was now stuck. They were stuck in a very difficult place. They're gonna to have to get out the hard way going over the ravines, uh, even with the Lancers chasing them. And Lieutenant Wallace took charge of what was left of the regiment and led them to the rear, eventually to safety. They reorganized and they participated in the final attack that defeated Santa Ana. That's all the Battle of Buena Vista you're gonna get here at Shiloh today. But it's important. Because that makes, it's important for two reasons. <laughs> One, Colonel Hardin, who is a rival to Abraham Lincoln uh, in the, uh, uh, to become congressman, is now dead. Removing one political opponent in Abraham Lincoln's uh, political career. We're not gonna follow that trail. That takes us to Washington. But we are gonna follow the other trail, it leaves William H. L. Wallace, young Will Wallace, the young uh, attorney from Ottawa as the hero of the day, the hero of Buena Vista. And when he comes back to Illinois, they don't let him forget that. And he is celebrated and feted, and all of the people whose loved ones did return look at William Wallace, at Will Wallace as the person that got their loved one out of that tight scrape in Mexico. Let's leap forward then 12 years. The Civil War comes. It's time for more volunteers. And one of the first people that Governor Richard Yates of Illinois looks to, of course, to command one of the first regiments, is the hero of the Mexican War, William H.L. Wallace. Governor Yates also picks another one of the heroes of Buena Vista to command one of the early Illinois regiments, Benjamin Mabry Prentice. So Prentice and Wallace both become important colonels right at the beginning of the war. Wallace rises quickly, so does Prentice. Prentice had more political influence. He got a star on his shoulder in August of 1861. Colonel Wallace led the 11th Illinois Regiment. They were here at Shiloh. Led the 11th Illinois Regiment in Missouri, at Cairo, and then into the campaigns for Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson. The Battle of Fort Donaldson, the 11th Illinois Regiment, was badly decimated. 
in a Confederate counterattack. But they held their ground. Colonel Wallace, as their brigade commander, held their ground. The Confederates were eventually driven back. And then a counterattack by the other Wallace drove the Confederates back into Fort Donaldson. Fort Donaldson surrendered. And once again, Will Wallace was a hero. The reward for that heroism came in late March here at Shiloh when he received notification of his promotion to the rank of Brigadier General. Now he'll wear a star on his shoulder and he is qualified to command a division. At that time he commands a brigade in the first, in McClernand's first division, but luck always seems to be following this guy. He has a great wife. He, uh, he was a hero at Buena Vista um, and uh, he had a great law career. Luck is with him here in the form of an accident. General Charles Smith, commander of the 2nd Division in Grant's army, barked his shin getting out of a boat. Barked his shin getting out of a boat in the Tennessee River at Crump's Landing. Didn't just bark it, he opened it from knee to shin, knee to ankle, all along the shin. It festered, it got infected, and by early April, General Smith could not walk anymore. He took to the Cherry Mansion to try to recover, where he died about a month later. So Grant suddenly has an opening for a division commander of one of his best divisions, the second division. So he reaches over and he grabs Wallace out of the first division, puts him in charge of the second division on, and on, I won't say the exact date because I'll get it wrong. But in the first week of April, 1862, Wallace becomes commander of the second division, one of the most experienced divisions in Grant's army. On the morning of April 6th, he marches that division down this road and into action. Now we're gonna pick up a little more of that information later, but now I wanna start stretching our legs and getting warmed up for the rest of this long walk. So follow me. Second Division were camped. Uh, he was a brand new commanding officer. Uh, he had recently learned, uh, in fact, he learned uh, uh, his, his wife, Anne, had been threatening to come down and visit him for some time. Uh, and uh, she was, in fact, on the way. Now, that night, Wallace was concerned, like a lot of other subordinates in Grant's army, he was concerned that the Confederates were out here in force. General Grant denied that, General Sherman, the commander of the camp, and the commander of the most advanced uh, uh, 
the most advanced division denied that. Uh, they were very confident that there were not a large number of Confederates in the Union Army's front. Uh, but that night, the night of April 5th, uh, a couple of Wallace's staff officers, uh, Captain McMichael and Lieutenant Rumsey, uh, rode out to the 5th Division and actually visited with General Sherman. And uh, they talked to some of the subordinates who had been out on patrol, and those people were all saying, we're about to get attacked. We're, there's going to be a huge attack on this camp. Uh, they went to Sherman. Sherman said, not today, but eh. uh, Sherman was still wrong about it. And uh, then they came back and they reported, Rumsey and McMichael came back and reported to Wallace that they thought that there was going to be attack, an attack the next morning or sometime soon. The morning of April 6, 1862, Will Wallace received the word from Pittsburgh Landing that Ann Wallace had arrived and was on a steamboat right there at the landing and uh, of course he wanted to see her. Uh, he got up and he got dressed in his dress uniform and he was putting on his best uniform when Rumsey and McMichael found him and uh, at the same time he was getting ready the word came that there was fighting at the front. There was fighting out there at the front. And he thought to himself, I could, I could go visit Ann or I could take the division out on my own responsibility just to make sure we're there. He chose the latter, figuring maybe, as he'd been assured by his superiors that there weren't many Confederates out there, he'd march his division out, someone else would beat up on the Confederates, and then he'd bring them back for lunch. <coughs> Probably what he was thinking. He didn't get to write down his thoughts that day later. So, he called out the 2nd Division. Three brigades under Colonel James Tuttle of Iowa. 2nd Brigade under General John MacArthur of Illinois. 3rd Brigade under Brigadier General Thomas Sweeney. Colonel Thomas Sweeney. He's still a colonel. Colonel Thomas Sweeney. His first reaction is to use General MacArthur's brigade as a fire brigade. He wants to send the regiments to various places where they will be most useful. He sends one of MacArthur's regiments to guard the bridge across Snake Creek to make sure that General Will, uh, Lewis, Lou Wallace will be able to cross that creek. He sends another regiment to reinforce General Sherman from MacArthur's brigade. And then General MacArthur takes what's left of his brigade and marches out to the far eastern side of the battlefield where he will fight in the Peach Orchard area and will not be available to Wallace for the rest of the day. Then Wallace formed the rest of his division, Colonel Tuttle's Iowa Brigade and Colonel Sweeney's Brigade of Iowans and Illinois troops marched straight out the Hamburg Purdy Road, got to the intersection with the Eastern Corinth Road, turned and came right up the Eastern Corinth Road. That was about nine o'clock on the morning of the battle. He immediately, he came up here to deploy his infantry. The artillery came later, including this battery where we're standing now, Stone's Battery of Missouri Light Artillery. He also, following good doctrine of the day, made sure that there would be a regiment of infantry to support this battery of artillery, and he took the 57th Regiment of Illinois Volunteers from Sweeney's Brigade and left them here to support this battery. Now, Colonel Thomas Sweeney is a regular Army officer also a veteran of the U.S.-Mexican War, lost an arm. He's also a veteran of the Battle of Wilson's Creek. He's considered one of the strongest officers, one of the most capable officers in the Army. As a result,
Sweeney has the largest brigade in the Union Army. He has the most regiments under his command of any officer in the Union Army. So Wallace figures he can afford to take one of them here and support this battery. He then takes another of Sweeney's regiments, the 50th Illinois Regiment, and sends it down the Hamburg-Savannah Road to support General MacArthur. For now, this looks like it's going to be okay. Uh, the battle is still developing. Let's head on up this way. He deployed another battery. They're also going to have to stay on this high ground and fire at Confederates down there. And following the same logic, he needed a regiment of artillery to support this battery. He had pulled the 57th Regiment out of Sweeney's brigade to support Stone, and he ordered the 8th Iowa Regiment under Colonel James Geddes to support Richardson's battery. So he said Sweeney had the largest brigade in the Union Army, and it was six regiments, but already General Wallace has pulled three regiments out of Sweeney's brigade, leaving Sweeney with a brigade of three regiments. Follow me. And there seems to be, there's a uh, traffic behind us, so let's split to the side of the roads, please. Crossing uh, where before in yeah, the creek split. Okay. So we had, we had two crossings. I see. He is. I heard about that. I'm very excited. Very excited. University of Kansas Press. University Press of Kansas decided to take a chance on the topic, and I'm glad they did. Oh, did you go to that? Okay. Oh, that's a good book. The fourth book is excellent. Much needed. All right, it's still early in the battle, and General Wallace has brought his regiment, has brought his division this far forward. We are now at the intersection of the Eastern Corinth Road and a farm lane that bordered the Joseph Duncan property, Duncan Field over here, passed all the way down through the woods until uh, I connected with the uh, uh, Hamburg and Savannah Road at the uh, Sarah Bell property. Uh, the road was somewhat worn out, maybe 12 to 18 inches below grade at any given place. A typical frontier farm road. So it was sunken. It was sunken and this is called the sunken road. Uh, and this is, and this made a very natural place for Union defenders to deploy. Not necessarily because the road was sunken, although of course you could lay in it and that would be pretty good protection. But it was because it was here and it defined the edge of this field and it connected these two, um, these two properties and these two roads. That's what made the sunken road um, a natural definition of the Union defensive line. Now what was happening before Wallace got here? Well, early on the morning of April 6th, Wallace's old Mexican War comrade, uh, General Benjamin Prentice, commanding the 6th Division, out there on the front line of Union camps, General Prentice suffered an attack by an overwhelming force of Confederate soldiers. Shouldn't be a surprise to you by now that Sherman and Grant were wrong. There were lots of soldiers. There were lots of Confederates out there, and they were preparing to attack this position. So at about 9 o'clock, after fighting uh, for about 
uh, three hours to defend their camps, General Prentice's division was destroyed. They were overwhelmed and driven from their camps and driven back to this area. As they retreated, they rallied upon this road that seemed like a natural place to rally, a, a uh, country road, a farm road, a farm lane that ran between these two important roads. Who was left of it? General Prentice started with a division of about 5,000 men, and by the time he rallied them down the trail here, he had about 500 left with him. Uh, most of the rest were either casualties, prisoners in the hands of the Confederates, or skedaddling as fast as they can for Pittsburgh Landing. So when Wallace arrived here, he found Prentice holding a very small front of the Sunken Road position. And Sunken Road, it's not even a position yet, it's starting to evolve. There are no Federals here, there's just a little remnant of Prentice's division down the road here. As a result, Wallace conferred with Prentice and decided, okay, I'm gonna tie in with you. I'm gonna tie my division in with yours and we're gonna extend it right down this sunken road. So, Wallace deployed the left of his two brigades in this area and then started deploying the rest of his two brigades to the north and west down the sunken road as it fronts the Duncan Field. These here on the left, on the far left of his position, he deployed the Iowa Brigade of Colonel James Tuttle. And here, the 14th Iowa deployed right here where their monument is. So these, these Iowa infantrymen fell in here, lay down in line of battle behind the road or in the road, stretching all the way down there. Once he got the brigade deployed, he got word from General Prentice that his line was too thin, it's still too thin down in General Prentice's area. So Wallace took Colonel Gettys and the 8th Iowa Regiment. We just met them back there at the cannons. They were supporting those cannons. And he sent the 8th Iowa to extend the line down there so he would finally have a firm connection with General Prentice's small force. And then the rest of the division deployed in that direction. We're going to talk about them in a little bit. But at this point, the first attacks of the Confederates on this position start to come through. Now, General Albert Sidney Johnston's plan of attack calls for his army to turn the left or eastern flank of General Grant's army, drive them away from the Tennessee River and into the swamps to the north and west and destroy them. From the Confederate point of view, and we're only going to stay on the Confederates here for a second because we need to talk about our defenders. From the Confederate point of view, they've already run into two serious problems. One, the first attacks on Sherman and Prentice's camps, that victory had convinced them that they had turned Grant's left flank and they would now start pushing toward the swamps. For that reason, quite a lot. That reason plus the, the very heavy resistance they got from Sherman and Prentice causes the Confederates to commit the larger part of their army not to the east where they can turn Grant's left flank but to the west. And so while Wallace is deploying along this road, the larger part of the Confederate army is driving General McClernand and General Sherman north over on the western side of the battlefield. At the same time, General Johnston discovered his mistake and that he needed to take his reserves all the way down to the east, all the way down past the Hamburg-Savannah Road to turn the Union left flank and drive them to the north. So this, this leaves us with a math problem. If more than half of the Confederate Army is on the west side of the battlefield, 
And if almost half of the Confederate Army is on the east side of the battlefield, what is left in the center? <clears throat> Not much. Not much. And the commander of the Confederate center, center is General Braxton Bragg. And he is pretty much left without resources. He has to grab brigades that are going to the left or to the right as they come by and impress them into his uh, command and send them to attack the center of the Union line. That's too bad for those Confederates because during this period of time, 9 to 10 in the morning, between 9 and 10 30 or so in the morning, along this sunken road, the Federals under General Prentiss and under General Wallace have established a very, very strong line. In front of them, a dense thicket, a lot of undergrowth, a lot of uh, natural, uh, natural uh, uh, problems for the Confederates to work through. <coughs> Grapevines, thorns, second growth. And then out here to the north, an open field that they would have to cross and get shot at the whole way as they come across. This is a very strong position. The Union forces have about 9,000 men between Prentiss and Wallace defending this position. And during the course of the day, the Confederates attacked it repeatedly. If you've seen the movie, you know they attack repeatedly. But no Confederate attack that came against this position had more than 2,500 Confederates in it. Of all of the repeated attacks against this hornet's nest position, some people say 11, it was 8. Of all of the attacks against this position, none of them came close to even having even numbers. Add to that, the Federals have artillery. Here, Monk's battery from the 6th, from Prentice's division, pushed straight up into the front line. Well, all during the day, the Confederates made repeated attacks against this position. Stevens' brigade, Shaver's brigade, four attacks by Randall Gibson's brigade, all of them coming straight up the eastern Corinth Road. The Confederates would have been shaken out in line of battle, so the left of their the left of their battalions would have stretched all the way out into the Duncan Field. And each time they came through this thicket, they were torn to pieces by the fire of these Union defenders. At one point, they came very close to capturing the cannons down here, the 5th Ohio Battery. And when that, was, and when that happened, Colonel Geddes, the Scotsman, and his 8th Iowa, fixed bayonets and charged into that thicket down there, driving the Confederates back in a hand-to-hand -hand encounter. Uh, one of the few episodes of hand-to-hand -hand fighting, bayonet to bayonet, at the Battle of Shiloh. The battle is mostly a shooting battle. But this part <laughs> of the Union line holds firm right here all day long until something goes wrong elsewhere, until the flanks are turned and these men become entrapped. And we're going to talk about what happens to them a little bit later. But what we're going to do right now is start to move. Normally what would happen in a hornet's nest program now is we go down to General Prentice. We're going to leave General Prentice alone. We're going to let him do whatever he wants. We are going to head down this direction and find out what is happening with Colonel Tuttle and Colonel Sweeney. And then it finally goes due east until it reaches the Hamburg Savannah Road at the Petro. I'm not going to stay here very long, but I want you to use the high ground you're on to get a good look at this Union line. Um, you probably noticed the shape of the monuments you're looking at. You were just, we were just at the 14th Iowa Monument. 
Down from there is the 8th Iowa Monument. And here is the 12th Iowa Monument. The state of Iowa chose to make all of their regimental monuments when they put them here after the battle uh, identical. They all look alike. And how that helps us right now is we can trace, by looking at the monuments, the line of Colonel Tuttle's brigade as it extends across the eastern side of the Duncan Field, of Joseph Duncan's Field. Now when the brigade first arrived at this position, even before the Confederates made their first attack, Please. Colonel Shaw, let's make way here for the folks to get through. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Colonel Shaw deployed his 14th Iowa up on top of the hill, and then Colonel Woods with Colonel Tuttle turned into this ravine and marched down the ravine to the main Corinth Road. And that's where they deployed, back here in the ravine. Now once they were in the ravine, once they were safely covered there, they could come out to the sunken road and the infantrymen could lay down in the sunken road if they needed to fire. Uh, but when they didn't need to fire, or when they were later when they were under artillery bombardment, they could take position sheltered in this ravine. Historian of the Shiloh National Military Park belonged to the 12th Iowa, uh, Company C of the 12th Iowa, uh, which would be in the center of the regiment. So Reed would have been exactly where his monument is standing. Yeah, you might not want to sit on the fence. Well, your motor's all right, but I need you to. No, they're Tunnels, uh, Tunnels Brigade of Wallace and Division. Yeah. We walked right by the. He got no money. Huh? He got no money. He got no money. He knew exactly where he wanted to put it. He put it right there. Uh, he's also the one that tells us that the tunnel was quite the ravine. It's in the he did that in the speech dedicating that money. Who makes sense? Who makes sense? Yeah, but that doesn't mean they didn't utilize the road. Uh, they, they absolutely did. It's just that they principally deployed back there in, in the ravine in Cape Fort River. And Jeff, you had this uh, theory that that's where the Simon Codenam came from, I think. Oh! Oh, really? It's possible. Yeah, but I think I, I like my theory better. <laughs> <laughs> that was this. <laughs> that was the old farm road. And, yeah. and all old farm roads all were sunken. Right. I thought it was uh, Antietam had one in the east, so we gotta have. I, I like that yeah. one too. Yeah. I, I, it's not original. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta have ours. Marketing. Uh, we have reached the right flank of Colonel Tuttle's brigade. This is the Second Iowa Infantry, and so throughout the course of the day, the Confederates send one after another weak attacks through the thicket at the top of the next hill. Uh, that the term weak attack is not should not confer any discredit upon the Confederate soldiers making those attacks. They made those attacks with desperate bravery. They came right up to Tuttle's line and right up to Getty's line up there. And sometimes they had, to, as we know, sometimes they had one time they had to be driven back with hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Uh, so they took desperately uh, terrible casualties and they fought with desperate courage. But there was never any chance 
that the Confederates would punch through the center of the Union line. They never once made an attack that could have been calculated to win the battle. It was just necessary, Bragg felt it was necessary, keep attacking the center uh, in order to keep these troops occupied. Very few of the attacks came this far north. Uh, like I said, the left flank of some of those attacks came through south, Duncan, and troops of the 12th Iowa and the 7th Iowa participated in driving them back. One attack, uh, an attack by General Stewart, um, Confederate General Stewart, came into this part of Duncan Field. They advanced about halfway across the field, realized that they could not possibly, that it would be suicide to come up and attack this fence in the sunken road. They received the fire and then they retreated back into the woods. Question, was there yes. actually a fence along the road? I believe there was a fence along the road. Yeah, according to the historical maps that they made after the battle, there was a fence along the road. I think if by then the Union Army would have burned all the rails for firewood. Well, they might have, but they might have left some of them too. This is not the same Union Army that later burned its way through Georgia. These were newcomers, new soldiers. Now, follow me. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go across the road because we're going to get a better view here. Buck will let our friend go first. In the road, you can look back up the main Corinth Road. I can't see it from here, but you can see the monument to General Wallace. Right here. Couple of guns down that road. Now, during the course of the fighting, all day long, over there toward the hornet's nest, General Wallace remained toward the left side, toward the southern flank of his division. He remained not down there to supervise what he considered was uh, the men that he needed to supervise more closely. Colonel Tuttle was not an experienced brigade commander. Uh, he had Colonel Geddes with his 8th Iowa Regiment alone attached to General Prentice's division, but also under uh, his own influence. Wallace stayed down there. He left this end in charge of his trusted subordinate, Colonel Sweeney, Colonel Thomas Sweeney. Now late in the day, about five o'clock in the afternoon, Wallace received a very surprising bit of information. He said, the information was, our right flank is turned. Confederates are behind us. Now the last report that General Wallace got from Colonel Sweeney was as soon as they deployed in this position uh, at about 10 or 11 in the morning, I think. Right, we're going to get some verification as we move up the hill here. Sweeney sent a message to Wallace saying, I am driving the enemy. In other words, we're winning. I've deployed my brigade and we're driving the enemy. Wallace heard nothing more from Sweeney for the rest of the afternoon. And when he received the report that the Confederates had turned his right and were getting behind him, he was indignant, refused to believe it at first. Where's Sweeney? Sweeney wouldn't do that to us. Go back and double check. Sent his aide back to look for Colonel Sweeney and his brigade. Zade came riding back. Lieutenant Rumsey came riding back. They're gone. 
They're not here. We, our flank is turned. At which point, Colonel, Lieutenant Rumsey rode off to try to find out what was going on. We're going to tell his story later. But about five in the afternoon, after consulting with General Prentice, while enduring the bombardment of these Confederate guns that were marshaled on the other side of Duncan Field, and all the way back into the Hornet's <coughs> Nest. Wallace and Prentice determined that they needed to try to get out. They needed to get their men out of this trap. They weren't sure why, but the Confederates had turned both of their flanks, the left and the right, they were coming in behind them, and they needed to get out of the trap. General Wallace came down here and led the 2nd and 7th Iowa out of the sunken road position into the main Corinth Road marched back in that direction. At the same time as other Iowa regiments about faced in their positions and started marching to the rear. And they found the Confederates in their rear that they had to fight. About five o'clock, General Wallace, having led the safety, was on that high ground right there. Looking to the north, looking at Confederates swarming in this creek back here and coming up through the Stacy Field, looking where Sweeney was supposed to be, maybe looking for Sweeney, maybe looking back at Pittsburgh Landing where Ann was waiting on the steamboat. At that moment, facing to the northeast, Trying to figure out why those Confederates were there, General Wallace was struck in the back of the head by a Confederate bullet. Passed through his head and out his right eye socket. Fell from the horse at that position, and at that position, what was left of the Union forces there lit out for the rear. Two of his assistants, a couple of his assistants, tried to carry General Wallace to the rear. They couldn't carry him very far. They put him on the ground and they continued to the rear. Certain that he was dead. Turned out he was alive. He lived until the 10th. Um, when they got him up to the Cherry Mansion and on board the steamboat, Ann was sure that he recognized her, squeezed her hand. Uh, over the course of a few days, she said that he spoke. Um, take her word for it, uh, but he had a desperately terrible head wound. <coughs> and on the 10th of April, General Wallace died in the Cherry Mansion in Savannah. So we've only been talking for an hour and we've already killed General Wallace, who's the star of our show. <laughs> I still got an hour and a half. Ah. Yeah, I kind of, I kind of swept through the first part of this program. Uh, a lot of us have been on Hornet's Nest programs before. We've heard the stories of the Confederate attacks through the thickets. We've heard the stories of Ruggles' battery. They all deserve to be told. We've heard the stories of the gallant defense of the sunken road position by the Iowans. But what I was thinking when I thought of putting this program together, I was thinking, what was General Wallace thinking in that last moment before he was struck by that mini ball? Musket ball, who knows, it came out of his eye. What was he thinking? The romantic in me says he was thinking about his lady. I like to think about that. But, the historian in me is pretty sure he was thinking where the H-E-double-L -L is Sweetie. He's supposed to be here. I left him here. He didn't send any messages. I thought it must have been going fine. 
And now we are in a world of trouble with Confederates, with a hole in our flank and Confederates pouring through. So the rest of our program, we're going to try to answer that question that General Wallace didn't have enough time to consider answering on that day. Where is Sweeney? What happened to the right flank? Which is why we're starting that portion of our program here, where the right flank, or where the second Iowa regiment, <laughs> Colonel Tuttle's regiment, pardon me, the second Iowa regiment of Colonel Tuttle's brigade extends across the Corinth Road and links in with the left flank regiment of Colonel Thomas Sweeney's brigade, the 58th Illinois Regiment. Come over here. Grand Hilton Road, not even hit. 